thank you to, for inviting me to be with you today. I have the pleasure and honor of serving as your director for evangelical mission, as well as your synod minister for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I am part of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, and I live on the reservation with my family. This past week, I led the blanket exercise as part of a large view program through an organization committed to ending the root causes of poverty. For those of you who haven't yet experienced the blanket exercise, the blanket exercise was originally created by Kairos, a nonprofit organization in Canada in collaboration with indigenous communities and teachers and religious leaders in order to raise awareness of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. It's designed to help participants begin to form a common memory and start conversations about how we might build intercultural bridges together. During the exercise, participants literally walk through US history and after the exercise, there is space for us to do group debrief together. After this past week's blanket exercise, we were invited to share lunch with the participants. There are about 15 people on my blanket exercise team and they're scattered throughout the Synod and so four of them will come with me to accompany me at any given event. At this particular event, there were three of us, one of whom was our bishop. During the lunch, a Jewish man sat down next to me. We began to chat. At one point he said, with everything that your people have gone through, it's amazing that you've survived. I paused and then I looked up at him and I replied, I suppose the same could be said about your people. We sat for a moment in silence, and he was the first to break that silence of that space. He spoke of resilience and survival, rooted in knowing that sacred spiritual covenants cannot be broken. First Lutheran Church, we gather today in this building, in this city named Duluth, in a state that we call Minnesota, because on September 30th, 1854, 85 Ojibwe leaders, representing 85 individual communities in 10 different Ojibwe bands, gave settlers permission to do so. This wasn't a democratic vote. This decision was made by consensus, and it wasn't just the consensus of the 85 leaders. Everyone in the community had to agree. If one person, one clan, one community, or one leader had decided not to sign the treaty, then it wouldn't have happened. My grandfather, Joseph Bozaghi, represented our community. He signed the 1854 treaty that ceded land in northeastern Minnesota to the United States, granting settlers the right to build communities here, establishing reservation boundaries for the 10 bands, and retaining our right to hunt, fish, and gather anywhere on ceded territory forever. Our people talked about this treaty for nearly four years before we signed it. Conversation started in 1850 when territorial governor Alexander Ramsey concocted a scheme to forcefully relocate us west of the Mississippi River. He and the Indian agent working with him violated the 13 different treaties, sacred commitments, legal contracts that we had signed together between 1795 and 1847. Hundreds of people, nearly 12% of our total population died on Ramsey's death march. It's remembered as the Sandy Lake tragedy, which suggests it was accidental, 
but it was no accident. It was calculated. They had planned it for years. So we kept talking. We talked more when our chiefs wrote a letter to President Fillmore in 1851, citing our grievances and requesting his assistance. Fillmore ignored us, so we brought the conversation to his office in 1852. Five of our chiefs, my grandfather included, were led by Chief Buffalo, who was more than 90 years old at the time and our most respected elder. They traveled first along the shore of Lake Superior in a canoe. At Sault Ste. Marie, they boarded a steamship. Once they got to Detroit, they got onto a sailboat. They took that to Buffalo, New York, where they boarded a train. In New York City, we're not exactly sure if they went by foot or some other way, but somehow they got from New York to Washington, D.C. It took them more than two months. They promised that they would not come home until President Fillmore had heard the voice of our people. They didn't have an appointment. They didn't have permission to travel, which was something that was required by law at that time. They didn't even have enough money for one leg of the journey, let alone the journey back. But they were determined that they would not fail because they believed in the sacred promise. Despite the odds, they did meet with Fillmore. And Fillmore promised that attempts to relocate us would cease, but they didn't. So our people continued to talk. For two more years, we talked. And when we gathered on Madeline Island in 1854, we didn't have consensus. The ceremony started at sunset on September 28th. For more than 24 hours, we prayed. Then, on September 30th, we decided to avert war, and our leaders signed the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe. We've been working out how to live well together here ever since. The U.S. government, Governor Ramsey, the state of Minnesota, has never apologized to our people. Minnesota didn't even issue an apology when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1999 that the state had violated Ojibwe treaty rights for over 160 years. But the story doesn't end there. In 2021, at our church-wide assembly, the ELCA officially apologized to American Indian and Native American people. The ELCA acknowledged for not acknowledged or apologized for not seeing God's presence within the cultures and worldviews of indigenous people and for contributing to the erasure of indigenous communities directly and indirectly. In 2021, we acknowledged that saying nothing sometimes says it all, and the ELCA publicly repented of its silence. This was the next step in a journey that we had started together five years prior when, in 2016 Churchwide Assembly, we passed the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery and admitted complicity in the colonization of indigenous peoples. Then in 2017, the Northeastern Minnesota Synod, our synod, called for the formation of a bridge building task force to lead all of us in truth telling and healing process. Together Here Ministries was planted as a result and for six years together, we have been listening, learning, and growing in relationship with indigenous peoples and tribal communities. Then last year, our synod took our commitments one step further by extending reparation payments 
from money received through real estate sales right here in the city of Duluth. Our reparations to Minnesota Chippewa tribe continue to be held up within the ELCA as an example of how we can honor our commitment to live well together in this world. On a local level, you have a very dedicated group of people right here in First Lutheran that has been leading you through this work. They've written and led services of repentance and reconciliation. They've hosted the blanket exercise. They've initiated, they've invited conversations with indigenous leaders to share the stories and the perspectives of our community and what it means to us as native people to live well together here. And currently, they just finished, I learned last last worship service, a booklet of the stories from this place so that you can not only learn these stories yourselves, but that you can share them so others can learn as well. Today is Indigenous People's Sunday. In 2018, our synod chose to set this Sunday aside to honor the gifts talents, and worldview of indigenous peoples. And tomorrow, according to the proclamation that was released a couple days ago, on Indigenous Peoples Day, the United States will honor indigenous peoples preservate, pres <laughs> we've got extra help up here and it's awesome. Yeah, it is so awesome. So <laughs> the United States will honor indigenous peoples perseverance and courage. They will show gratitude for the contributions indigenous peoples have made to our world and renew the U.S. government's commitment to respect tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Friends, we are on our way towards bridging the divide between our nations. Together, all of us have done good work and we've come a long way. But all you have to do is read the online comments on any given news article talking about treaty rights, and you will see that we have many, many, many more bridges to build. Two weeks ago, I had the privilege of participating in an artist night at the Chief Buffalo murals right here in Duluth. If you haven't gone, you should go. As I listened to the artists share the stories of the murals, an Ojibwe artist, I watched the non-Indigenous peoples in our group. Many of the stories that I grew up hearing that I carry deep in the recesses of my DNA were falling on their ears for the very first time. The murals are filled with images that reflect the way I see and interact with the world but I could tell that these same images were foreign to most of the non-native people in our group. It's amazing to me that after all these years, friends, it's been nearly 350 years since Daniel Graceland broken, brokered the first fur trading agreement right here in this community. 350 years. It's amazing to me that after 350 years of interacting with each other, we still don't understand each other. We still see and treat each other as foreigners. In today's gospel reading, Jesus tells us that the vineyard owner allowed the renters to live well in a vineyard that was not theirs. Yet rather than show gratitude when the harvest came due, the renters killed the owner's messengers in order to claim the vineyard for themselves. Indeed, indigenous and non-indigenous relationships have come so far, and yet we have so, so far to go. The Jewish man 
was the first to break the silence that had fallen between us as we chatted over pizza after last week's blanket exercise. He lamented of cultural genocide and spoke of resilience and survival rooted in the knowing that sacred spiritual covenants cannot be broken. When he finished, I responded. Despite it all, despite all the attempts to eliminate us as indigenous peoples from this earth, we are still here. We are still here for many of the same reasons that your people are still here. Our existence is grounded in God's vision of creation and our survival is rooted in a sacred covenant. Thank God for the sacred covenant, the covenant that unites us. Thank God that through Christ all creation has received the covenant of survival. I pray that we continue to grow in our willingness to honor the sacred promise in each other. I promise that we, or I pray that we will continue to work building bridges across the divides and learning to see the world through each other's eyes so that one day, and I hope a day very soon, we will no longer see each other as foreigners. And I pray that we will learn how to honor the land that we both now call home. I pray. I continue to pray. Mother Teresa once said, the Christ in me is the Christ in you. One of my most fervent prayers is that we will live like we believe this is true. Amen.